Hello students, welcome to Fatigue Analysis for Extreme Environments. I'm Dr. Stewart. Today we're going to do strain life approach for notches. Now the strain life approach, as we already know, is a local approach. And this is because strain is measured locally within structures, measured across a gauge length. The application of the strain life approach for notches involves two steps. First, there's the determination of the local, meaning in the vicinity of the notch, stress and strain fields. And then finally, there is life prediction using those local measures and the strain life equations and procedures. How do we deal with notches and mean stress um, with the strain life approach? There are three methods. There's Weber's rule, there's Glinka's approach, and there's Kaladin's method, which we won't cover. Uh, we're going to focus in on Weber and Glinka. Now, let's actually focus in on this concept of strain and strain fields as well as this concept of yielding. Here we have two images that illustrate the stress and the strain fields in the vicinity of some stress concentration. In this case, there's a hole and some structure. Now, these structures, or this, this structure, is loaded so that local yielding is going to occur in the vicinity of these notches. The diagrams show two concepts. One shows the elastic theory. This is assuming a linear elastic material, while the other shows the actual stress fields that we expect with yielding. We can see here in this in the stress plot that elastic theory projects a very high value of stress with respect to the remote loading value, with where, where sigma y is a remote loading, right? Um, while in actuality, because we've reached the yield strength of the material, the actual stress field is much lower and much more moderate. What that means is that local yielding at a notch reduces the stress concentration factor in the vicinity of that notch. Now, this reduction in stress, where the stress is not at the linear elastic point, but it's actually at the yield strength, corresponds with plastic deformation. So when we go and we look at the strain fields, we see that the elastic theory assumes a certain amount of strain, pretty low value, while in actuality, we have much more strain due to the plastic deformation. So with strain hardening materials, when we reach the yield strength, stress remains low and strain begins to grow. Now, this concept on strain, where the strain is increasing, uh, allows us to think about the concept of a strain concentration. And so we can calculate a strain concentration factor, K eta, as equal to eta divided by E, where eta is the local strains in the vicinity of the notch, and E is the net strains that are measured over uh, some uh, reduced cross-sectional area, so uh, a uh, gauge length across that area. If we were to plot uh, the stress concentration, uh, K sigma, and the strain concentration factors, K eta, we, and we were to plot those as a function of applied stress, we're going to see something interesting as we move through the yield strength of the material. When we're below the yield strength, the strain concentration, stress concentration, and in, in fact, the, the, just the KT in general, remains the same. But once we start to yield, our material starts to exhibit stress relaxation, where the stress remains low and tracks with the yield strength of the material, so our stress concentration appears to decrease, while the accumulation of local yielding and plasticity increases our strain concentration. 
Now, the first approach we're going to learn on how to deal with this is to use Neweber's rule. And this is a rule for monotonic behavior that states that the, uh, the strain concentration times the stress concentration is equal to the, uh, the, the, the KT value squared. So that is like a constraint equation which defines the relationship between the increase in strain concentration and decrease in stress concentration above the yield strength. We can rewrite this as simply that the uh, strain times the stress, and these are the local values measured at the notch, are equal to kt squared times e times s, which are our remote loading conditions, right? For a linear elastic material, let's remind ourselves that e is equal to the s over e, so we can revise this relationship as follows, that eta times sigma is equal to, in brackets, the kt times s squared over e, the modulus. Using this relationship and applying the ramberg gerg osgood equation furnishes the following equation, where we include both the uh, Neuber's constraint, as well as the Rembert Osgood relationship with the constants K and N coming from our monotonic properties in table A.2. And we can solve this, uh, we can solve for the stress, this is a nonlinear equation, we can solve for the value of stress using some iterative scheme, so it's a numerical method, and be able to predict how our uh, stress uh, 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 our, our, our um, not our stress, but our monotonic tensile, tensile curve is modified by enforcing that relationship, the Neuber's relationship. And we can then determine the elastic and plastic comp components of strain accumulation. How would this really work? Uh, the idea would be for us to uh, create a fully elastic model of our, our components, say it's a Turbine blade, we would then uh, um, phenomenologically analyze in the vicinity of our holes, and then we would apply some shakedown method where we go from that fully elastic linear elastic response and modify it using Weber's rule to get to our real plastic stress strain response in the material, right? And then from there, taking that stress value, I mean that strain value, and 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 applying the strain life approach. All right. Now, uh, in order to create our hysteresis loops for fatigue, Weber's rule needs to be modified a little bit. For initial cycling, what we do is we replace the KT term with our fatigue stress concentration factor, KF. And we replace the K and N monotonic properties with the K prime and the N prime properties. And that's to get us our initial curve, our initial to, to the, the first or the, the peak point on our hysteresis loop. Now to actually create the loop, to, to find the, the actual enclosing loop, we need to use the hysteresis, hysteresis loop stress drain equation. And that would be to treat everything in terms of a, a range, a stress range uh, and a strain range. And Again, adding our fatigue stress concentration factor, Kf, uh, to, to create and enclose our loop. And then this, these two equations work well when we have uh, fairly simple yielding, when we have a case where the plastic strain field is not larger than the elastic strain field of the entire structure, right? But when we have components that are subject to gross yielding, where there's plasticity across the entire ligament area, we need to introduce other more complicated techniques, right? Now, let's uh, look at an illustration of how this Weber's rule actually works. Let's assume that we're cycling uh, over some fixed remote loading range, right? So a S max to a S min. This is our, uh, not remote loading, but our, our net uh, stress loading over the uh, ligament area, right? We can, applying Neuber's rule, generate a stress strain of response at the notch by applying Weber's equation. 
The first path is that very first equation we have in order to establish the initial loading path and define the maximum stress point of our hysteresis loop. To create and generate the hysteresis loop itself, we need to apply the hysteresis loop equations so that we can move from S1, this max value, and figure out the path to S2, the range, downward to get to our uh, bottom point of the hysteresis loop. And then any subsequent loading, we would apply the same equation and we would return back to S1. So that's how we enclose our hysteresis loop. The second approach that we can apply to deal with mean stress and the effect of notches was introduced by Glinka. Uh, Glinka's rule assumes that the strain energy density at the notch root is nearly the same for the linear elastic notch behavior and elastic plastic notch behavior as long as the plastic zone at the notch is surrounded by an elastic strain field. What that means is as long as we have some elasticity in our ligament area. As long as we are not fully plastic across the ligament area of our component, we can make this assumption. Now, this strain energy density, where does it arrive from? We can find it as, as simply the area under our stress strain uh, curve. So it's an integral of stress over the entire range of strain uh, that we are exposed to. Now, we'll define Ws as our nominal strain energy density. This would be across our ligament area. And that is the integral of the nominal stress over the nominal strain, right? We can further divide that nominal strain energy density into elastic and plastic portions where the elastic portion is fairly simple to derive from uh, uh, the theory of elasticity with Young's modulus, and where the plastic strain energy density is going to arrive from the Ramberg-Osgood equations. If we are to set the plastic and elastic portions together, then Glinka's rule becomes the following where we have the Ramberg-Osgood type relationship on the left-hand side, and then we have a kind of constraint equation, very similar to what we had with Neuber's rule on the right-hand side. This is the equation here for fatigue with a, uh, well, no, this is the equation here for um, monotonic loading because we have just K and N, and then this here is the equation that we have for, for fatigue hysteresis loops, for creating the loops themselves where we have a K prime and an N prime, right? Now let's look at an example, or let's just kind of summarize the example that's available in the book. The example available in the book uses a similar geometry to our previous video example, right? this uh, compact tension uh, circular notch specimen. And in this notch specimen, our static stress concentration factor KT is equal to 3, and this is, is made of a RQC100 steel. In the example, we're asked to do a couple of things. First, we're asked to, to find the notch stress and strain from a 12 kip monotonic loading, right? So we need to find what are the notch, and, uh, notch stress and strains uh, at, the, at, the, at the tip there. Part B asks us to find the notch stress and strains after unloading from the monotonic loading in part A. So that asks us, will there be some residual plastic strain once we've unloaded? Case C asks us to find the notch stress and strain amplitudes from a constant amplitude alternating load between 1 and 10 kips. So this is asking us if we have fatigue cycling, uh, what 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 is the the uh, notched stress and strain amplitudes, and then finally D asks us to find the expected fatigue life to the formation of a crack on the order of one millimeter from the loading in part C. Now, how do we uh, work towards solving this problem? 
Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to gather the material properties for the RQC100 steel. The next thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to work through the steps in getting our KF factor and getting uh, the other material properties together into either Neuber's rule or into Glinka's rule. Then we'll need to create our initial load path and then also find the hysteresis loop for our material, right? Once we've created that hysteresis loop, for, the, for example, for the fatigue loading condition, then we can calculate from the notch stresses what the stress amplitude is, and then from there, go and apply the, uh, uh, or the, uh, the what is the notch strain range here and the strain amplitude, and then apply the strain life approach to predicting cycles to failure. A more detailed, uh, or a very detailed, description of how to solve those three steps is provided in our textbook. I really encourage you to go through and work through that procedure. Uh, and when you do, what you'll find is for each of these categories, using either Neuber's rule or the strain energy density approach, different measures. In our next video, we are going to learn how to deal with notches in the linear elastic fracture mechanics approach. We're going to also look at the two-stage method and one more video after that. All right.